All right, uh, we are going to kind of jump back into uh, David, and we were talking last time, I believe, we were right here. Is that correct, David and Bathsheba? Okay. We talked about David's sin with Bathsheba, right? That David and the king, when kings went out to war, over here in Jordan, Joab and the boys are fighting, David's over here in Jerusalem, he, gets, he has an affair with Bathsheba. He calls Uriah the Hittite back. And we talked about the process of temptation and how guys have oftentimes problem with their eyes, second looks, and the problem with second looks with intention, action based on desire, and then blaming Bathsheba. And how I said that well, I've heard people preach this passage and they blame Bathsheba for this thing. And I don't think Bathsheba is really at fault. David is the one who's at fault here. But it's a normal thing, and I kind of like it. You know, whenever a guy gets in trouble, he always blames the woman, you know? That's a good method. Doesn't, doesn't work in my house, but some people try to pull it off. Okay? Uriah, turns out, is an upright person. Uriah comes back from the war over here in Transjordan. He comes all the way back. He's been out now for several months fighting, and he does not go back and sleep with his wife, even though David's trying to set that up to cover over the pregnancy. And so Uriah is upright. The reason why he doesn't go to his wife is because the ark of God is out fighting. And Uriah says, how can I go sleep with my wife when the ark of God is out in a tent in battle? David then gets him drunk, but even drunk, Uriah doesn't go down to her. Did we, talk, we talked about Nathaniel's, did we talk about Nathaniel's parable? We did that, where he tells a story about the guy with the little sheep and the guy with hundreds of sheep. And the guy with the hundred sheep takes the one man's own little private sheep that he had and it's just basically Nathaniel is rebuking David Nathaniel is the prophet the prophet rebukes the king and the prophet kind of keeps the king in check and then what happens usually then the prophet goes to the king repent and then what's the king usually do beats up on the prophet so prophets get beat up a lot you know the kings have more power than the prophet does prophet speaks the word of God and the prophet, another role that I didn't develop last time, the prophet, remember God gave his word in this covenant? So you have the covenant, this treaty, this oath between God and the people from Mount Sinai. The, the prophet reminds, is kind of like a prosecuting attorney, that he goes at the king and he says, king, you've sinned, you've broken the covenant with God. And so the, the prophets are kind of prosecuting attorneys that are prosecuting on the basis of the covenant of God. And, and they come to the king, and, and they are like a checks and balances, almost like, you know, in America, we are supposed to have like checks and balances, Congress, you know, the executive branch and the things. This is kind of the checks and balance between the king and the prophets. So Nathan goes to David, the story of the little lamb. David gets really upset. Nathan says, David, you're the man. You took this guy's... Uh, one little wife that he loved. You've got David, you've got how many wives now? And you took, and David, you're the man. And then Nathan, Nathan's a good guy. David doesn't beat up on Nathan. Nathan, David repents, which is now, we want to walk through that. So David then, uh, Nathaniel comes, and what happens is, let me just kind of read through the story. Um, that Nathan said to David, David, you are the man. This is what the Lord God of Israel says. I have anointed you king over Israel. I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. If all this had been too little, I would have given you even more. And God just tells all the benefits and stuff. And he says, David, verse 10, Now therefore the sword will never depart from your house because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. Okay? And God says then, the Lord says, out of your own household I am going to bring calamity upon you. Before your very eyes your, I will take your wives and give them to one who is close to you. David's wives, he says, I'm going to take your wives, David, and give them to someone else. Just like you took Uriah's wife for yourself, someone's going to take your wives. Who would take David's wife, wives and violate them openly? Does anybody remember that? Absalom. Absalom, David's own son, is going to violate his concubines in, in full view of everybody. So David is going to be shamed by his own son, Absalom. And, um, but then what happens next? Um, 
secret, but I will do it in broad daylight before our Ezra. And David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. David repents. He realizes he sinned. He doesn't get mad. He realized, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, the Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die, but because by doing this you have made the enemies of the Lord to show utter contempt, the son born to you will die. So now David knows that the son that's going to be born is going to die. Now how does that affect him as a father? <coughs> and he starts fasting and praying. David starts fasting and praying. He knows God's already told him the child's going to die. Nevertheless, David prays anyways. Is it possible to pray against God's will? David already knows God's will is to take the child, but David prays against it anyway. He's hoping that God might be merciful, okay, and that God might change his mind. Have we seen God, you know, be, be merciful in the case, in several cases in Scripture? So David's praying for that mercy of God, praying against what God just told him, saying David pleaded with God for the child. And he fasted, and he went into his house and spent nights lying on the ground. And the elders of the household stood beside him to get him up from the ground, but he refused, and he would not eat any food with them. So David now is fasting. He won't eat any food. He's really, really upset, and he won't eat anything. On the seventh day, the child died. David's servants were afraid to tell him that the child was dead. Why were the servants afraid to tell David? Because that the child was dead. While the child was still living, we spoke to David, but he would not listen to us. How can we tell him the child is dead? He may do something desperate. What were they afraid? Yeah, David's child dies because of David's sin. Is it possible David, they think David may kill himself, do something really stupid, okay? Because he's so upset that his sin caused the death of his child. David noticed that his servants were whispering among themselves, and he realized that the child was dead. Is the child dead, he asked. Yes, they replied. And then what I want to do is watch David's reaction here. It's really kind of interesting. When <coughs> Yes, they replied, he is dead. Then David got up from the ground after he had washed and put on lotions and changed his clothes. He went into the house of the Lord and worshipped. Then he went to his own house, and at his request they served him food, and he ate. And now all his servants are freaking out, saying, wait a minute, wait a minute. We told you the kid's dead, David. And when, when David's told the kid's dead, what does he do? He gets up, he takes a shower, he puts on new clothes, and he eats. And you say, wait a minute, what kind of grieving process is that? And so his servants asked him, why are you acting this way? While the child was alive, you fasted and wept, but now the child is dead. You get up and eat? He answered, while the child was still alive, I fasted and wept. I thought, who knows? The Lord may be gracious to me and let the child live. But now that he is dead, why should I fast? Can I, can I bring him back again? And then David makes this statement. I will go to him, but he will not return to me. I will go to him, the child, the child's dead. I will go to him, but he will not return to me. And David comforted his wife Bathsheba. And then they had another son. By the way, their next son's name was what? Shlomo, Solomon. Okay, Solomon. Okay. So 